For people who want to know what is the Key Fangy Network, the whole point of my talk show is to show you that even with having a word of disability, I can style them out to something. And at the same time, I'm able to turn myself into an example for people out there dealing with any types of word and disabilities and disabilities to never give up and prove people wrong. Prove to them that labels do not dictate who you are and who you're going to be. So prove them. Stem out to some. Hi, I'm Rita Stevens, and um, I'm on the Keith Andrew Network show. Um, I enjoy talking with Keith. It's a great show, um, and I love talking about books and writing and helping other writers with their goals. Hi, I'm Crystal. I'm being interviewed by Keith Andrew on the Keith Andrew Network uh, from across the pond down on the south coast here in Brighton, England. Um, it's a lot later at night. It's been a great experience. I highly recommend anybody to be interviewed by Keith and to listen and watch the interviews. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Keith Andrew Network. We have not one, but two great guests here on the Keith Andrew Network. As you heard from the recommendations, you, the guests, have introduced themselves. But we have a professional, upcoming actor and writer here on the Keith Andrew Network. With that being said, the first question I want to ask, because we have the top 15, that is right, the top 15 questions we're going to talk about. Box one, we're going to start off with you. What attracted you to begin your career as a professional actor? Um, well, it's, it's odd. I, I came late in life to it. Um, I sort of, you go back to the 80s, I was working in insurance, I was doing a bit of stand-up comedy, then I stopped doing that, and then I got into amateur dramatics. And then I got into, I did improvisation, some improv lessons and that. And uh, then um, I, I got made redundant. I had a relationship breakdown. And it's something I'd always wanted to do. So that's the perfect time. So I did a, like a foundation course at one college, then a postgraduate diploma in acting. And then I was away, really. I also occasionally write. haven't done that for ages. And I have directed. And I'm back to doing some comedy now as well, because there's less acting work being offered at my age. So I'm getting. To, I'm doing stuff on my own as well to keep myself busy. Yeah, absolutely. And box two, as I look at your profile, you are an award-winning writer of books, scripts, and I have no idea <laughs> how to pronounce that last part. But you are also a teaser. That's you, box two. Oh me? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, well, um, I write books and scripts and adaptations. I teach writing. I'm also a forensic nurse. I help others with their medical uh, poison and uh, forensic questions for their stories. Um, and I just, I've been writing ever since I was a little girl. Um, I just, I, I tell people I used to lie to my father and decided to make a living at it. <laughs> <laughs> And now let me ask you the same question as you asked Spock Swan. What attracted you to begin your career? Uh, I loved reading. Uh, it helped me to escape from the bullying and everything around me that I didn't like and the arguments. And I, I would hide in, in the underneath the curtains and, and while my parents were arguing and I'd be reading and, and living in my, in my um, fantasy world of the books I was reading. And I decided to to start writing. No, that sounds absolutely amazing. And have you ever written articles before or articles about people? Oh, all the time. I write lots of articles. Well, we can I'm, I'm an article about domestic violence right now. <laughs> well, we can definitely talk about that off the air. But the next question I want to ask you, box one, is what is the biggest change you want to make in your acting career? Um, oh, I, that's that's an interesting one. Well, the biggest change I'd, I'd like, I'd like, actually, in the moment, I'm like, there's been a reduction of opportunities because I'm older. And um, one of the changes that's happened now is we do lots of our auditions by self tape. We just tape yourself, and I, I actually, I, I find that difficult because my great thing was when I was auditioning was I was good at taking direction, and also like to chat myself, present myself as somebody who'd be easy to work with. And I've lost that. So the biggest change I'd like to do is to see more people face to face for my auditions and castings. That would that would because I think I have more of a chance <laughs> if they if they actually have a real human. Even I would prefer than the self tapes to do it like this over Zoom, 
you know, that would be better because we'd have some interaction. So I'd just like to see more of that. Um, I don't know. It's it's difficult. It's, it's a very, I'm in a very strange state of my acting career at the moment because it's, it's kind of winding down. So I'm asking whether I should do it, do other stuff. So, I mean, it's been an, an interesting time, but it's, it's becoming more difficult. But uh, as that's why, as I say, I'm, I'm doing this uh, comedy show now called Rabbit Hole Comedy, because it's all different sorts of comedy, because when you go down the rabbit hole, you never know what you'll find. So we're, we're doing a show up in London at the end of March. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, I'm hoping to connect with some, I'm, I'm engaged with some performers I haven't worked with before. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that will take off a bit now and I'll be a bit more in control myself rather than just waiting for other people to give me work. Well, two things you did bring up, and before we go to box two, but we're we'll staying with you for a second. You mentioned starting late in life. You know, you don't have to follow the trend of, you know, follow the sheep. You start when you're comfortable. You know, you, it doesn't matter if we start in your fair right. And for me, I started my talk show when I was 26. A lot of people are like, oh, well, you sort of started it when you were 16. But then at the same time, people are like, oh, you weren't mature enough. You weren't ready. So it's about the white. <laughs> well, someone said to me, the white price, the right time. And it's when you are comfortable in your career. Yeah, I was a bit later than 26. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> described it as my midlife crisis, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> But you have to do what you love. And now going to box two, same, same as that question, but we place an act in for writing. So what's the biggest change you want to make in your writing career? Uh, I'd like to see, well, a lot of the publishers have um, con conglomerated and made it hard for some people to sell their books and stuff like that. And um, so many writers are going to independent publishers now. Um, and I think more and more writers have to learn to do their own marketing, which we didn't before. A lot of writers just depended on the publishers to do the marketing for us. Uh, the same thing with the scripts and stuff like that. And a lot of scripts are, a lot of movies are being made that you look and say, oh, how did that get made? You know, <laughs> and, and my story is better than that. But a lot of it is networking, getting to know people and uh, just, you know, being persistent and being out there. So <laughs> I guess the change is, is, is learning to be persistent. No, I agree. And in a little bit, I will pass it over to you guys so you guys can interact with each other. One thing about the Keep Angie Network, I like and enjoy bringing people together. Plus, you make new friends out of it. So when, when. And you've been on the show multiple times. The reason I wanted to do a double interview is because we always do one-on-one -on -one interviews. Oh, I wanted to do something special. That's why you're here with me and Chris. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think the last time you were on my show, uh, I was doing it on Skype. And I think it's like, what, 2016, 2015? Like uh -huh. Yeah. Well, you can say after you watch the, I know right now, but I'm turning my camera off because you will know once the video quality and the editing is done, he's like, you know what? This looks so much better, and he got out of his own way. So right now, as you're, we're talking, it's a black screen. But if you're watching this on social media and YouTube, you're going to see a lot of special effects. So, you know, to be patient. <laughs> but the, the point is, I came a long way in 10 years. Oh, yes. We, we, we grow each time we do something. We learn and we grow. So the one thing I want to ask you is, how's your hand doing? Oh, fine. Much better. Uh, <laughs> thank you. No, absolutely. So we're going to stay with you on this question. The next one I want to ask you is, what are some of the best writing advice you have ever gotten? Um, to write, well, they say to write what you know. But I think the one thing is, is to do research on what you're writing about. Um, you can write about almost anything as long as you research it and understand it um, and ask questions of the professionals in the industry. Most people are very willing to uh, answer questions like uh, police and, and lawyers and stuff like that. They're always willing. They're, they're excited about answering questions for you. And have you ever ghostwritten or have you ever thought about ghostwriting a book for someone? Oh, I, I, 
I do that all the time. I, I've, I've done ghost writing many times, and I've also done writing assignments for producers as well, where they've given me their ideas, and uh, and I've had a run with it. Hey, so we have some great ideas today that we can talk about off the air. Now, Chris, this is the next question I want to ask you. Is, sure. As an actor, this is not a nine-to-five job. This is kind of like what I do is my talk show. You're always auditioning. And the same thing about writing. You're always writing. You're always acting. You're always doing something. It's 24-7. So it'd be nice if we get paid for it. <laughs> but you're always doing this around the clock. So the question I want to ask you, for people with disabilities who want to follow in your footsteps, what are some of the best acting advice you have ever gotten? Uh, that's, oh, that's interesting. Um, so, I mean, the thing is, I, mean, I there's a friend of mine who who is Downs, who, who's a very successful actor. And really was because her mother really advocated for her when she was young, younger and it, keeping her in the mainstream schools and starting to act. And and it's, I don't want to give any particular advice to people who are disabled because the, 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 we've become a lot better at using actors like that in the, in, in the, in the UK and better representation. So you, you see more different people on screen. And, and what's nice, I think, sometimes is when the disability is just not even part of the character. They just happen to be like that. And, it, and it's not, you know. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I mean, the best, I don't know, the best advice, good advice is, and it can, uh, lots of actors say, is, is, is you can get very tight and nervous in, au in auditions and castings. So the thing to do is just to say, I've got someone in front of me. I've got a chance to perform. I'm going to enjoy it and not try and get the job. Although I have a story, it's a very strange one, where I, because for various reasons, I got seven weeks, I think it was seven weeks acting work, out of an audition for various reasons, I tried to get out of three times. It was a whole day's workshopping. And in fact, they only attended half a day and still got the job. So that's, I don't know, there's no logic. Some friend of mine said to me, you know, people say acting's unfair, but you can either say it, it's, it is, but it also it's, it's just random what happens. I mean. He tells one where he had to, he was in a studio and the four chairs set out to pretend to be a car and it's for a car advert. And the casting director just harangued him for not, for being the only actor who didn't mind opening and shutting the car door. <laughs> and then he got the job. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what advice, I mean, the advice is to be resilient really and, and to have, and to work out of every, every, you know, you have side hustles to work out a way of surviving financially when you're not acting, that you can fit in and around your acting. And, and the other thing, times is, is, is what's quite good, is to have other things, is to get on with life sometimes when you're not acting and not be obsessed by it. It can be good to get away from it, not to be continually obsessed. Because what can happen with a lot of actors is that every job is about what's the, is getting the next job. And you've got to really, there's got to have a really good reason to do this job and enjoy this job in the here and now while you're doing it. Because otherwise you'll, and, and the other thing is, I think it's not to worry about making it, whatever that means. There, there, was, a, there was a guy who was an opera singer and he said, because what happens is then is because you, you may be making it, has, you, you give yourself a big target. You've done things that are really good, but you don't appreciate them because you haven't made it. Yeah. But you've done those yeah. things. They, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I've done, um, you know, it's, I, I think I'm very proud of it. I did a few years ago is where we have a fringe festival here where I did Shakespeare shows in people's private houses is one of the most successful things I've done. And in fact, one of the actors who worked for me, she now teaches in, um, uh, she was American, she teaches in a university in Nebraska, and she tells her students that's one of her best experiences of her professional life, which is really nice. So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of been, do you know, and, and another friend of mine said, if you're only as good as your last show and you have a bad show, well, forget it. Make the next one a big one, a good one. Then it's done. So those are the advices I'd give. You know, it's funny to say that. I, I feel like that sometimes my interviews, I sometimes I do a wonderful interview. The next one's like, I have no idea what the hell he's even talking about, but all right. But the next one is then the next one's better. So I think one of the big things is being persistent and knowing your goals and just keeping at it. Uh, go, just continue to swim, as they say. My friend Scotty, he always says to me, "Keep enjoy the journey, not the destination." Right. And why do people keep saying to me, "I should write a book," and I would love to talk to you about writing my book. Uh, I tried, I failed, 
I'm not a writer. I'm not a storyteller. But, but I don't know. I guess you are your own worst enemy. You are your own worst critic. But personally, if I was on TV more, if I was doing more, if I, okay, you know, I reached my goal. But then you're like, no, you write your book before you become famous. And this is a question for you both of you. Have you guys ever written a book about yourselves? And do you think you should write the book before you become famous or wait till you accomplish some goals? Then you have something to brag about. And box two, we're going to start off with you. Wow. Uh, well, my brother says every character has something of me in it. Uh, so I, I, in a sense, I'm writing about myself all the time. Um, I mean, I put myself into all the characters that I'm writing about. What, even if I'm writing historicals or, you know, or mysteries, whatever, because, you know, you have to be part of that character to, to get the audience involved. Um, but I've never written, um, I've written articles about my life, adopting my daughter as a single mom and things like that. Um, but I've never really written, um, a book about myself. I, I, I think of myself, well, my life is really boring. And people say, no, it's not. <laughs> you know? So, you know, it's like, um, I don't know. I, I think people wouldn't really be interested in reading it until you've accomplished something. I mean, that's, I mean, that's what I would think, you know, you know, it's, it's hard enough selling a book when you're already famous. You know? <laughs> that's true. Um, I yeah, I would say I haven't I've, I've, I've written any books. I've written a few plays. Uh, although my, my preferred way of creating work is to be in a, is what's called devising, where you create it through improvisation, um, which is what, what a lot of what I'm doing uh, on, on my show. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a, a. Do you understand the English word blag? Mm -hmm. Do you know what to blag something means? It means to bluff. You know, you don't yeah. really know what you're doing. Yeah. But I have a couple of shows I've done. They're called my blag shows because I'm quite good at. I can write like a, 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 a A4 is a, is a European paper, about the same as 11 inch paper in America. I write a series of bullet points, and I can then I can use those to talk to an audience for an hour quite often. And I've done a couple of shows like that. Um, one was about all all my acting disasters. <laughs> so it's the various <laughs> things that that went wrong. And another one was I did one because. Um, because we had this thing called Brexit here, I had an Irish grandparent, so I got um, an Irish passport. So I, I, I did a show in, in Dublin called New Irishman Seeks Help Being Irish. Mm. Although it, we only got four people and two of them were Australians. It didn't quite work as well as that. But it, that, was, um, that was all about, because I have, I have connections with Ireland over the years, visited over the years, um, and about people's, you know, and, and the idea of... of um, of, of, of what you need to do to learn to be Irish because there's a there's an expression now because so many Brits have got these Irish passports now that we're referred to as plastic paddies by the Irish <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so um but yeah no that that was that was fun I mean I, I got a I was offered a space free in in Dublin had a nice time over there so that was good yeah but it's <laughs> uh, what happened was the tickets were free because it's tryout then the day was sunny at the end of the day and there's a lot of rain in Ireland, so a lot of people who said they were coming decided they'd want the sunshine instead of me. But well, there you go. <laughs> but it, I, it, it's useful, and bits of that show and bits of that will, will I, I use in other ways. So all these things are they kind of recycled. Um, but the one based on some of my real life experiences, uh, what I call there's an expression everybody does these sort of little tours, and we all all of you are in a van with the stuff behind you. And I've had one that went very well and one that didn't. And the expression in England is everybody has to have in their life to one what's known as hell in a van tour. <laughs> so I talked about that one, which is which is which was a very strange. Well, I I had to replace another actor at short notice, strange enough, in Ireland. And it turned out he'd left a note on his pillow and just disappeared. And then as the week went by, I started to realize why he'd left the note on his pillow. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's a lot of, you know, even that was a strange time. I still enjoyed it quite a lot, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now we're going to do something special because we have two guests. I want both of you to interact with each other. So uh, while I say this next part, I want you guys to think of questions to ask each other. The first thing I want to ask you is, this is going to sound like an oxymoron, but 
in a, a blessing in a disguise with the whole pandemic, you know, of course, you know, 8, 000, 8 million people died and it's a horrible, big disaster. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of people always said, I wish I can stay home, work from home, never leave my home. I don't know why you want to do that. Then you feel like you're under freaking uh, house arrest. <laughs> it's always nice to go out and interact and do things. But the, the, what I'm, I'm trying to say is, which the whole pandemic has just given you a different point of view and have you ever refocused your life? And this has got to be with box one, passing the show over to you guys. Yeah, well, um, in the UK here, we had various lockdowns. My favorite was the first one because that was a real lockdown. And I remember um, walking through like empty streets. So I, I'd walk up the middle of the street because there's no cars. You could hear the birds singing. And luckily, we had uh, some good financial help here. So I wasn't like financially stressed by it. I did loads and loads of cooking that I had time for. I never had time for before. Um, yeah, and, and it was, you know, it, I mean, it, it was, it, it was, it, 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 it was, it was quite, it was quite nice in some ways. And each each lockdown got less. And the, and the other thing that happened was just very weird. A lot of people put on weight during lockdown, but I lost weight because what they said here is. You could go. You could leave your house once a day to walk for an hour. So seven days a week, I walked for an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> I've never done that much exercise. So I lost about half. I lost about seven or eight pounds doing that. But yeah, it was. Um, it had, I mean, we, luckily we had a garden and it was really nice weather. So I sat sitting out in the garden drinking beer, uh, ordering different beers from around the UK on, on Facebook when I saw adverts. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it was. Um, yeah, it was it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a strange time in many ways, and, and it, it was quite difficult, obviously, for theatre and things like that. Strange enough, I actually I actually took part in a feature film during lockdown called The Lockdown Hauntings. Uh, do you know an actor called American actor called Tony Todd? Played the Candyman in the Candyman films. He's also in Full Metal Jacket. Oh. He was he was he did his thing over Zoom. I did mine over Zoom. I was a Zoom call with somebody playing my daughter. And the, the guy filming it, he filmed it all on his own, just one filmmaker. He, it's like a horror movie. So my close-ups are all pictures of her phone. So, and, and it's a bit weird. You also realize how badly synced Zoom is, because I had to do a clap to, um, so he could sync it later. And I, I could see the difference in sync just doing it. But yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that was interesting. So I, strange enough, managed to get an acting credit during a lockdown, which was, which was not bad. But um, yeah. I, I don't know. I think it's it's um it's an odd time in many ways, and um, but yeah, that that's my thoughts on it anyway. What about you and Box too? Well, uh, I did a lot of writing. I mean, as as a writer, I often write alone, so uh, it really didn't affect me as far as going out. Um, what affected me more is I didn't have in person meetings with the executives. Uh, for the studios and 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 the publishers, which I often do with my agent, so a lot of everything <coughs> on Zoom and people have have done more Zoom meetings now than before, and a lot of people are are working from home even more. Um, but I I, en I enjoyed working from home. I mean, but I always do. So it really didn't affect me that much, as far as that. I mean, uh, except for the fact that I was always worried about my health and wearing masks when I, you know. Um, you know, but thank God I, I didn't have problems with COVID. No, uh, me too. You know, I had it two times and my brother had it two times. Um, but I think he has side effects, but I'm not really sure. But that's the thing. And today we found out and a lot of people, well, let me go back a couple of years. A couple of years ago, there was a book called Chajin and how there was a virus that broke out. I think we talked about this on our last interview. The book called Kachajan, about how a virus escaped from a lab, and oh. it pretty much spread over the world. Fast forward, what, 70 years later, with during that interview that we did, Box 2, and uh, a couple of years later, now we're living Kachajan. And I'm probably like, oh, it came from a lab. A lot of people say, you know, it's a climate change and you can't. Well, well, today it came out, there's proof it came from a Chinese lab because a virus like this will mutate and eventually get weaker and weaker. 
this damn thing gets stronger and stronger. So what we found out it it's true. It, the Chinese did leak a from their lab. It was supposed to be made from a weapon. So thanks to them, we're gonna have this shit <laughs> hanging around. Um I am um, for me personally, I'm like it was the attitude, hey, you know, you shit the bed, you clean it. So if you can you created this, you better find a way to make it disappear. You know, that's my honest opinion about it. I don't know that they're gonna be able to do that. <laughs> but you know, it's 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 not a great weapon if it kills most of your own people, is it really? <laughs> no. As most... a, a biological weapon would be something that would you put it in the air, it would kill people, and then that would be the end of it, it wouldn't spread anymore. But yeah, so it's it's um but um there are other um I mean, I, I'm of an age, I've, I've realized I've been apparently been through three pandemics. I don't really remember much about the previous two. There was one when I was two, there was one in 1968 in the UK, a flu pandemic. But I, I, we didn't isolate anybody there because we didn't have enough facilities to do it. So that just ran its course. But um, I mean, the thing about whatever these things are, and, and, a, flu, and a flu virus could mutate to be a way to be worse, is intensive agriculture is, is the ideal petri dish for these things to sort of. And they jump from animals to humans all the time. Um, and bats are a particular, because bats have a hugely powerful immune system. So they can harbor and mutate the virus without, without having any effect on them. Right. So if it gets into right. bats, that's, 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 and that's one of the things they think about happened in these so-called wet markets in, in China, that, that's the problem. But, it's, um, but the big one was, you know, the Spanish flu after the Second World War, the First World War, which turns out not to have been Spanish at all in the end. <laughs> <laughs> but that that just um that that actually came stronger in the second wave i think but yeah it's um but this could have came a couple of years ago we had a couple of scares you know the bird flu okay. h1v1 scars but we always missed we always dodged it and then you can't dodge everything, unfortunately but i do have a couple of questions for you guys off the air but wrapping up i want to ask each of you one hard-hitting question that I ask everyone, and we're going to start off this box too, because you've been on my show multiple times. When I first approached you to be a guest on my talk show, what made you say yes again? How do you feel now, and would you recommend it? Uh, well, I always enjoy talking to you, Keith. You're, you're a fabulous intellectual person. <laughs> so, uh, and and uh, I like getting the word out about what I do. I like educating the entertaining. So uh, I'll say yes to almost any interview. <laughs> but no, I really enjoy talking to you. Yeah, likewise. So what about you, Chris? You know, the first time on the show, I helping me make a good impression. You, Chris, you know, first right. time on the show, helping me make a good impression. Yeah, you did. I I just didn't know what to expect. It was it seemed a bit it came from left field and and I thought, well, I've got the time. You know, I did nothing I, I can't come to any harm speaking to somebody over Zoom. So, so it's not a problem. I just it, I just I was just intrigued to see what it was like and I have enjoyed the experience thoroughly. So I, but I also as an improviser, the idea is you always say yes. Although as you get older, you may get a bit wary about saying yes to everything. But I, in the early days of my acting career, I, I, when I went to drama school, we had this um, mock audition with this actor. And it's a big thing in drama school, thinking about what sort of actor you wanted to be, where you wanted to go. And I said to this guy auditioning, we said, well, what, I don't know, what, what sort of actor do you think I am? Where should I go? What sort of thing should I aim for? And he looked at me like I was an idiot and went, well, at this stage for you, Chris, quite frankly, anything you can get. Oh, and so I did lots of strange things. I spent a lot of time in Germany on, on an especially uh, adapted double-decker bus, slightly scaring German primary school children to help them learn English, um, all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So, yeah, it's, so saying, saying I mean, I've got, as you learn more, you start, I now make more selection, but as a way of beginning, just saying yes to everything was good. So this is like almost harking back to the beginning of my acting career, which is nice. Yeah, absolutely. Stay tuned for Off the Air. I do have a couple of questions for you guys. But wrapping up, it was a real honor and privilege having you guys on the show. And I'm looking forward to doing this again. So until we meet again, catch you later. Thank you and have a good night. Hey, kid.